So good afternoon to everybody and welcome. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to the UniWell Open Lecture Series in the arena of individual and social well-being. My name is Karen Buchanan and I'm the Director of Integration at UniWell, the European University of Wellbeing. And I'd like to welcome our lecturer today, Professor Alla Fedorova, who will be speaking about European standards of human rights protection of displaced persons fleeing armed conflict. So before we start, I'd just like to explain a little bit about the format that we're going to be using today and how we would like you to participate online. So at the bottom of your screen, you will see the Q&A option. And this is where we would like to invite you to put in your thoughts, your reflections and your questions at any point during Allah's lecture. And at the end, if not before, we will pick up those questions and I will be able to pose those to her. So what we would like you uh, to do is to really step into this fascinating lecture that we're about to hear. I have the pleasure and the honor to introduce to you Professor Fedorova. Alla is a professor at Taras Shevchenko National University of Kiev in the Institute of International Relations, International Law Department. Alla is an international expert um, in the European, in the Council of Europe, departments of the European Social Charter and has worked for quite a number of years already as both a local and international expert in international projects run by the EU, the OSCE, as well as various Council of Europe projects starting a few years back, which are focusing on internal displacement in Ukraine, and since just a few years ago, another Council of Europe project on promoting the social human rights as a key factor of sustainable democracy in Ukraine. Very important, very, very relevant for us to discuss today. And with this, I would like to invite Alla to switch on your camera, you're doing it already, <laughs> and to give you the floor. Thank you, Alla. I'll switch my camera off now. Uh, uh, good afternoon, and thank you uh, for, for the kind introduction. Um, I would like to say um, thank you for the possibility to discuss uh, this topic and to everyone who joined this lecture. It's, um, it's a very difficult time for Ukraine and Ukrainians, uh, but uh, European countries also came across to unpredictable challenges in, in different spheres, one of which is um, mass influx of people uh, from Ukraine fleeing uh, the war. And uh, the European Union asylum system has never expected the situation uh, that it has at present. So I will tell you about uh, displaced persons in the context of uh, Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. And of course, it, it, it isn't the first displacement in Europe since World War II. Europe has, uh, Europe has repeatedly faced the, the need to ensure the rights of uh, displaced persons as a result of um, uh, armed conflict since uh, World War II. Um, uh, and that was uh, due to both conflicts in Europe and conflicts beyond European, uh, European bodies. Last 10-15 um, years, there were several uh, migrants or, or refugee crises in Europe. Thousands of, uh, of refugees from, from Libya, Tunisia, Nigeria, and some other countries uh, tried to reach EU borders, and, and, and then it was refugees from it were refugees from uh, from from Syria, Afghanistan, and etc. So some of EU countries, um, such as Greece, Italy, Germany, um, with a with a with a million a little bit more uh, asylum seekers, for example, um, were at the at the age of humanitarian catastrophe that that led to the uh, EU migration policy reforms, adaptation of new legal acts. Uh, and then the new pact uh, on uh, migration and asylum. So doesn't uh, from the first um, from the uh, from the uh, one side and um, uh, dozen of European countries such as Cyprus, um, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Macedonia, Croatia, 
Georgia, Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, Turkey faced with internal displacement. After, after Russia, uh, Russian invasion in, in, in Crimea and uh, occupation parts of Donetsk and uh, Lugansk regions in 2014, Ukraine came across to the largest influx of IDPs in modern history uh, of Europe for that time. And uh, you know that in 2015, 1.8 million uh, persons uh, were officially registered as, as, as IDPs in, in Ukraine. However, all of these crises and refugees, IDPs, uh, statistics or data uh, even couldn't be compared uh, with, the, with the current situation. Uh, during uh, during just just three months, millions uh, fled the war, and a lot of them lost lost everything: their 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 houses, belongings, documents, jobs, sources of income. And the vast majority of these people um, from Ukraine or in Ukraine are displaced persons now, and uh, have the right to obtain different uh, different statuses. So lots of them are IDPs um, and. Uh, in Ukraine, the fact of displacement isn't enough for the obtaining status of, uh, of, of IDPs. It's necessary to officially apply uh, for IDP status, status to, to be registered. And millions have already left the, the territory of Ukraine and um, as a consequence received possibility to obtain other statuses, apply for temporary protection, uh, international protection, and uh, you know that Ukrainians uh, don't need a visa for entering uh, EU countries and have the right to stay there without any formalities for three months, uh, uh, 90 days, uh, without, uh, just, just with biometric, uh, biometrical passports. And one more peculiarity of this war for, for Europe, if individual decided to leave Ukraine, uh, there will be the only possible way to do this cross the border with um, EU countries, uh, such as Poland, Hungary, Slovak Republic, Romania, uh, or Moldova. I don't even want to, uh, to mention the, border, uh, the borders with, with Russia and Belarus. It, it, it can be uh, the topic for absolutely uh, different discussion. And um, uh, there are documented cases of, um, of forced uh, transferring Ukrainian citizens and, uh, and, and children to Russia. So, uh, during this lecture, uh, I'm not going to tell you about armed conflict, international and, non, no, and non-international, and about war week teams, Geneva Conventions, etc. But what we will discuss the main categories of displaced persons or forced displaced persons. Uh, respective human rights in the context, of course, of present time and current situation due to the, due, due to the war in Ukraine. Um, one of the biggest uh, state, uh, states uh, by, uh, by population. So what kind of, of rights uh, do displacement uh, people have? Is there any European standards uh, for, for, for the protection of their rights? Different rights for different categories or not? And what is the main problems have already arisen or, or, or could appear in the future? So that's uh, what we are going to, to discuss now. And uh, let me... Uh, it was a it was, it was a small 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 introduction, and let me um, uh, let me share my screen with you and and start my presentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Something like this. So um, um, I, I, uh, let's start. Let's start with some uh, with some statistics. Uh, as I have already told, uh, a full scale Russian invasion in, in February this year has put Ukraine into the largest and fastest displacement crisis uh, since World War II in, in the world, both uh, internal and uh, external aspects. And uh, by the middle of May, uh, uh, 6.7 million fled Ukraine because of war. On the slide, you can see some data as of uh, 19th May. And 
10 days after that day, the, the total number of people who left Ukraine were uh, 6.8 uh, million. So about, uh, about 3 million people have been already registered as temporary protected persons in the European Union. And from, uh, from, from these almost 7 million, less than 15,000 uh, thousands apply for the international protection. So you could compare, um, you could compare uh, numbers, uh, so, so these figures with numbers uh, of refugees from, uh, from, from Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, and the, 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 uh, South Sudan, Myanmar, and, and et cetera. And uh, a little bit about um, international displacement. Aha, uh -huh, okay, it works. And about international displacement um, by, by conflicts and, uh, and violence. Uh, from 21st uh, of February uh, to the beginning of May, it was more than 8 million international displacements. Uh, and this is not Ukrainian statistics. Uh, according to, uh, so these figures according to international organization of, 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 of migration. And uh, let's compare IDP's uh, data from different countries, taking into account the, uh, the total number of IDP's um, at the end of uh, 2021, only by conflict and violence, according to uh, the uh, internal displacement monitoring uh, centers global report on internal displacement that was published in 2022. So Afghanistan has uh, 4.3 million. Um, I, I mean internal displacement process. Colombia, a little bit more than 5 million. Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, 5.3 million. Uh, Nigeria, a little bit more than 3 million. Uh, uh, Turkey, 1 million. Syria, 6.6 uh, million. And Ukraine uh, had uh, 850,000. Uh, eight, um, uh, internally, uh, internal displaced person by the end of 2013. Uh, so plus 8 million by the end of May uh, 2022. And uh, Ukraine is now leading this rank during three months of Russian invasion and received more internal displaced persons than the numbers have ever been registered in, in, in Syria during the years. So in, in total, um, <clears throat> Uh, 53 million people were internally displaced person by the end of 2021. And at present, it's more than uh, 60 million, uh, 60 million. Uh, I, I started with, um, with statistical information to pay your attention and impress you with, with, with these figures, with these statistics. So I want to make you think about the necessities for states to guarantee a range of rights of all these people and the possibilities, uh, possibilities, uh, financial, uh, technical, to, to do this. So just remember that it was a very difficult time for the European Union, just with several millions of, of asylum seekers. But now millions have already stayed in the European Union. So uh, in the last three months, Ukraine crucially changed the, the world statistics, especially European, in the sphere of displacement. And uh, the European Union uh, opened the new perspectives uh, for the temporary protection as, um, as an effective instrument for immediate, rea uh, immediate reaction uh, to the largest influx of uh, potential applicants uh, for the international, uh, international protection. So for the first time, the temporary uh, protection directive was activated uh, since its adoption in uh, 2000, uh, 2001. And under the, uh, under the presented uh, data uh, on the slide, you can see that, uh, that the application for refugee status is not popular among uh, Ukrainians who fled the war. So uh, they would rather be a temporary protected person, persons uh, than asylum seekers or applicants for subsidiary international protection. Why? In this, uh, in this context, it, it's important to understand uh, the differences between the main categories of displaced persons and uh, the minimum standards of human rights protection uh, for, for each category. So <clears throat> secondly, uh, we can read a lot of materials, uh, data, uh, etc., even on uh, United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Refugees official website, 
So it, it, it wrote about 7 million refugees for, for, from Ukraine. So in general, uh, this is acceptable to say about refugees, considering the broad understanding of the refugees by, by the commissioner uh, as all persons outside their countries of origin who are in need of um, international protection because of a serious threat to their life, uh, physical integrity or freedom in, in their country of origin as a result of uh, persecution, armed conflict, uh, etc. So, however, you have to understand um, uh, they are not refugees or even asylum seekers yet, but they have the right to apply for international protection and, and they could be harmed. That's, that's, that's the question. Uh, so the about consequences. Uh, what kind of consequences of this displa um, displacement? Heavy financial uh, burden for the state budget of European countries. Um, I'm not talking even about, about Ukraine. Inflation, the increasing of unemployment rate, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, I, I would like to, to I, I left the question mark, uh, mark for now. So uh, to understand the problem of displacement, um, possibilities for people fleeing the, the war, armed conflict to receive some protection, we need to pay attention to the definition, uh, to the definitions, uh, especially considering rather new category at European level, temporary protected person. Um, TPPs are, are displaced, but from classical point of view, this temporary protection isn't an international protection, and undoubtedly it was true. But after the activation of this temporary protection directive, we can see that this uh, status operates at the EU level and probably has a, a very good perspectives to be transformed in, at, at international level. But, but we will we will see. So uh, let's um, um, uh, uh, let, 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 let's talk about definitions. And what is the difference between um, all main categories of displaced or forced displaced person, persons? Uh, even from, from, from data or from statistical information, you understand what the main categories of displaced persons are. So two biggest categories, uh, refugees and asylum seekers and IDPs. So several words about, uh, several words about um, uh, displaced, uh, displaced persons. Displaced persons or forced displaced persons. In the different international and European documents, we can find both of these terms. And forced displacement underlines the result of push factors, such as persecution, war, uh, it could be in starvation. And, um, uh, and um, uh, in our case, uh, we pay the main attention to the displacement due to armed conflict. So this is undoubtedly a uh, push factor and people left Ukraine not voluntary. In general, a uh, displaced person uh, is an integrated complex concept. That means persons who are forced to flee from, from their places of living due to conflicts, violence, even climate, climate change or, or environmental or natural disasters. So uh, the, the definition of displaced uh, persons can be found in article uh, two of uh, the temporary protection uh, protection directive. So uh, third country nationals or stateless person who have had to leave their country uh, because of the situation prevailing in that country who may fall within the scope of um, of the uh, refugee uh, refugee convention or other international national instruments uh, given international protection and in particular two groups of persons. The first persons uh, who have fled areas of uh, armed conflict. So the first part, uh, this, is, this is our case. And with it, I know with it, the second part, persons at serious risk of, or who have been the victims of systematic or generalized violations of their human rights. You know, within this second, uh, second part, just, just, just wondering, is it possible for Russians to be treated as displaced persons in the case they left the territory of Russia or, or don't want to return? Just it could be it could be a question as well. And uh, 
uh, and uh, let's uh, let's start with um, with a definition and the standards and the human rights of refugees. So the main the main document uh, is the um, the Geneva Refugee Convention and its protocol that was adopted in 1967 and the convention was adopted in 1951. So uh, the definition was um, was given in Article One, but this definition is a little bit um, a little bit complicated. So uh, a refugee is a person uh, who has a well-found fear of persecution because of their uh, race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or uh, membership of a political social group, so five grounds, and uh, is outside of, uh, of their own country and, and cannot, uh, cannot return because of uh, this well-found fear. And the third point that uh, refugee cannot be protected in, in their own country. So in addition, uh, individuals who are outside uh, the, uh, the country of origin, but who may um, not qualify as refugees under the national origin or, or regional law, may in certain circumstances um, also require international protection. And of course, uh, of course there, are, there are different types of international protection. Um, except uh, except uh, refugee status, it could be subsidiary protection, it could be humanitarian protection. In some countries, it, it could be the same thing. So, if person does not qualify as a, as a refugee, he or she may be granted uh, subsidiary protection if there is a risk of suffering serious harm um, in case of, of returning to, to their own country. At European level, so this is a universal level. Uh, at European level, <clears throat> the definition was the definition of refugee was uh, given in their uh, qualification directive. But uh, you could see that uh, it's it's almost uh, the same definition as it was given by the um, Refugee Convention. Uh, the Council of Europe also tried to make its contribution um, in this sphere, and several documents were adopted, such as. Uh, such as a recommendation of the Parliamentary Assembly on the situation of uh, de facto refugees. And this, uh, this recommendation uh, was adopted uh, in 1976. And, um, and th what is crucial that, um, that this, this recommendation um, enshrined a list of minimum rights that uh, have to be guaranteed to, uh, to de facto refugees. Uh, so uh, for, them, uh, <clears throat> for the definition of refugee, for example, the, the Council of Europe applies the, um, uh, the conventional one. For example, in the European Agreement on Transfer of Responsibility for Refugees, refugee means a person uh, to whom the convention relating uh, to the status of refugee uh, applies, and, and that is all. So within the Council of Europe, many issues uh, were solved by the European Court of Human Rights, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, um, and which formulated a broad uh, case law linked to human rights of refugees, uh, IDPs, and etc. <clears throat> and uh, some important uh, soft law documents, regulations, and, and resolutions were also adopted within the Council of Europe, and often. Uh, they covered rights of several groups of displaced uh, persons. So refugees, for example, and IDPs. Um, uh, as example, uh, it's a, a very famous resolution uh, of, the, of the Parliamentary Assembly was adopted in 2000, uh, 2010 about uh, solving property issues of refugees and internally displaced uh, displaced persons. It's, it's European... Um, um, it, 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 it's, it's a European uh, principles for, uh, <clears throat> for property, for the protection of property rights of refugees and uh, internally displaced persons as, as Pinero principle at universal level. And as I have already mentioned, international protection includes not only refugees, but also uh, subsidiary protection uh, due to the lack of ground for the refugee status under the, the, the Convention 1951. And European states do not collectively uh, apply an extended refugee definition, which includes people fleeing indiscriminate and violence, for example. And um, uh, the, Council of, the Council of Europe uh, tried to use a broad meaning. Uh, for example, in 2001, the Committee of 
ministers of the of the Council of Europe recommended that subsidiary protection be granted to persons who are not refugees uh, in the meaning of refugee convention. And that was underlined in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the relevant, uh, relevant recommendation of the Committee of Ministers. And the provisions uh, about subsidiary uh, protection can be uh, found uh, in the uh, qualification directive as well. Uh, so the, the, the protection given to a third country national or a stateless person who does not qualify uh, as a refugee, but would face a real risk of suffering serious harm, um, would be uh, could apply for this subsidiary uh, subsidiary protection, and serious harm means serious and individual threat to a civilian's life or person by by reason of indiscriminate violence in situations uh, of uh, international or internal armed conflict, and uh, indiscriminated violence. Uh, indiscriminated violence is situations uh, of internal and uh, international armed conflict, uh, which presents a serious and individual threat to a civilian's life. So all this definition could be found um, in the qualification directive. So uh, if uh, some Ukrainians have doubts about refugee status, status in a particular state, uh, they, uh, they should not forget about subsidiary protection. Um, uh, so uh, applicants for the international protection, including asylum seekers, so persons who have applied for international protection or refugee status uh, can stay in can stay in an uncertain situation for 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 us a long period, even for several years, waiting this refugee status. And this is a key element that Ukrainians probably know about and and uh, uh, choose uh, this temporary protection in, instead of. Um, instead of um, application uh, for international protection for, for this moment. So um, there is uh, no convention, um, uh, no convention on refugee issues at European level, but there are a range of EU legal acts uh, on this issue, except Dublin, uh, except Dublin regulations. For example, new pact on uh, migration and uh, asylum, uh, asylum procedures uh, regulation. Uh, it's a special directive. The um, reception conditions directive, qualification directive, and uh, union resettlement framework. The um, new asylum and migration uh, management regulation and uh, new asylum agency regulation, etc., etc. Et et that that that's mean that the that the European Union has developed asylum uh, regulations and you know even uh, european court of human rights has collected legal positions from 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 uh, dublin cases so you could find this uh, fact sheets uh, on the on the, the website of european court of human rights and uh, and about uh, and about uh, human rights of refugees and uh, and asylum seekers so what kind of rights they have um, so um, we could say that, um, or we could start with our uh, reception conditions directive, and uh, this is uh, this is a directive uh, that prescribed um, prescribed rights not for refugees and for applicants for international international protection. So this is a. Uh, basic, uh, this, the, you could find the, the list with the basic rights, rights that must be guaranteed for applicants uh, for international protections. So uh, <clears throat> first, this is their, uh, the access to housing, uh, food, clothing, financial allowance, decent standard of living, and um, uh, medical care, uh, including, um, including psychological care. And uh, um, uh, and and uh, these uh, these rights uh, could be um, uh, could be added with the excess of employment within nine months uh, and and of course education for children under eighteen years old. So all basic needs must be covered for the applicants for international protection. 
and uh, we, we could compare these rights with the rights that refugees uh, obtain. Uh, so the uh, rights of refugees could be found and they are enshrined in the uh, in another directive. This is um, <clears throat> uh, this is the qualification directive. Uh, so uh, this this directive includes a broad list of rights. Uh, this is social welfare and social welfare in, in, in ensuring an, an adequate standard of living, clothes, uh, clothing, uh, non-food items, uh, daily express uh, expenses, allowance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then this is um, health care, including both uh, mental health care and physical health care, access to accommodation, access to employment and, and self-employment activities. Of course, it's education, and it, it could be access to uh, procedures for recognition, uh, recognition of, of qualifications um, and uh, providing of information and um, uh, consulting and uh, identification assessment and response to uh, to special needs. And, and, and th th this is this is a this is just the minimum uh, that refugees. Um, uh, that refugees um, must have. And, uh, you know, if you compare, of course, asylum seekers uh, have less rights and, um, and, 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 and certainty uh, for, for rather long period. So, and if we are talking about refugees, uh, their rights are very close to, uh, to rights that, uh, nationals, uh, that nationals have. So, uh, and uh, temporary protection. And uh, there is uh, temporary protection, it's, um, it's uh, usually it's national phenomenon. And there is no uh, special uh, international treaty on, uh, on, on temporary protection. At the universal level, you could find just the draft of the guidelines, guidelines on temporary protection elaborated by, by the International Law Association in, 2000, um, in 2002. It was recognized that in the case of large scale influxes, not only refugees with the meaning of the convention, um, the convention refugee convention, uh, but, but uh, also other persons fleeing the indiscriminate effects of armed conflict or situations um, uh, could be, uh, could be uh, protected. And this temporary protection offers a protection to individuals who can be treated as refugees and uh, or or not? So it doesn't matter. But uh, this is a pragmatic pr uh, uh, a pragmatic response to specific uh, to specific uh, protection uh, protection uh, needs. And um, uh, <clears throat> the the European Temporary Protection Directive was mentioned in, in these uh, guidelines. But temporary protection has not been included in the category of international uh, protection from, from classical point of view. Uh, so different countries elaborate their own uh, procedural rules and standards for the temporary protection. So <clears throat> uh, you could see the, the definition of temporary protection and, um, uh, and uh, under these uh, guidelines, uh, persons who have fled their undiscriminated uh, effects of armed conflict can be temporary uh, protected, uh, but but the main document, uh, but the main document um, uh, that regulate temporary protection was adopted by the European Union. This is a temporary uh, protection directive, and uh, this directive was adopted in two thousand one, and uh, at first time in history was activated um, several months ago. Uh, so under uh, this directive. Temporary protection means a procedure. Temporary protection means a procedure of exceptional character um, in the event of a mass influx, and uh, for immediate and temporary protection for for such for such persons. In uh, in particular, if uh, there is also a risk that the asylum system will be unable to to process this influx. Um, in, in, in a proper way. So this directive uh, was adopted because of the conflict uh, in the former Yugoslavia, uh, but, but for the first time uh, since its adopt adoption, it has been activated due to Russian uh, large-scale um, invasion by the, council, by the council decision. And 
the personal scope enshrined in, in the Article 2 of the Council decision. So um, you could see that, um, uh, that who are the person uh, who could apply for this temporary, uh, temporary protection. So this person's uh, displaced from Ukraine on or after 24th of February, and could be Ukrainian nationals uh, residing in Ukraine uh, before 24th of February. It could be stateless persons, and it could be nationals of third countries, and etc. and the family members uh, of these persons. And a special provision about people who were legally uh, resident in Ukraine before, before the war was included in, in, in part two of these articles. So, <clears throat> Uh, for example, it could be people who are unable to return in safe and durable conditions uh, to their country or, or region of origin. So that's why some foreigners and even some foreign students uh, from Ukraine have already had problems in, in several um, EU countries because of this because of this provision. So EU countries can grant immediate protection to people without the need for individual application for international protection without long waiting period. So it could be just several hours or, or several days for, for doing this. So this is a really new thing, new, new thing at, at European level. And, um, and uh, uh, let's, uh, let's talk a, a little bit about, uh, about rights. But you, you know, however, uh, except uh, EU directive, uh, there are national mechanisms uh, for temporary protection. For example, in 2021, Colombia announced about granting temporary protection status to more than 1 million uh, Venezuelans. For example, Canada, United States of America uh, have, um, have provisions about, uh, about temporary protection as well. So uh, 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 let's talk about uh, rights of temporary protection persons. Uh, so first of all, uh, the temporary character. So this, this status has a temporary character it, and it can be canceled at, at any moment if the situation in the country of origin changes. On the other side, uh, the, the simple procedure of obtaining almost the same rights as uh, refugees uh, have, um, it's, a, it's a really very positive uh, element for, for applicants with a, with a minimum requirements, uh, requirements um, for obtaining. Temporary protection can be received in, 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 in really in, 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 a very, um, in a very quick time. So for example, uh, it could be, it could be uh, as I told you uh, before, it could be several, several hours. But now, for example, Hungary, um, uh, uh, Hungary uh, <clears throat> have the, the maximum uh, 45 days for the, uh, for the decision about temporary protection. And in Czech Republic, the temporary protection uh, decision has to be given up to 60 days. But this period um, was extended because, uh, because a large group of Ukrainian, Ukrainian Roma people, um, came and vast majority of these, uh, these Ukrainians um, has, has, has double citizenship, not only the Ukra Ukrainian one, but uh, Hungarian as well. So um, we, we, we could discuss the situation a little bit first, but this, re this really complicated, um, a, compl a complicated situation for, uh, for EU countries, how to check how, how to check this, uh, this citizenship of, of, of Hungary and Romania. And we know a lot of uh, cases when, um, when uh, Ukrainians could have this, um, uh, this citizenship as well. So um, temporary, uh, temporary protection status gives immediate and effective protection. Persons don't need to wait for medical care access, uh, access to labor market, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, temporary protection, um, and activation of this directive, it's called EU uh, rapid response. This is really true. So the, uh, the rights, <clears throat> the fallen rights, you could see on slide, on the slide, uh, the fallen rights uh, was prescribed by the temporary protection directive. So residency rights, access to labor market and self-employment activities, um, uh, adequate accommodation, social welfare and, <coughs> sorry, and means of, um, of uh, substances if, if, if needed. 
uh, access to medical care uh, and uh, medical care and medical assistance, access to um, uh, education for, for children under 18, and uh, right to family uh, reunification and, 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 and others. So that's just the, the minimum rights. And however, uh, there is nothing in the directive about uh, monetary uh, benefits and some kind of allowance for family or each um, individuals. It can be prescribed by national legislation, uh, but the, the amount of such uh, social benefits um, uh, is different uh, as well as their duration. So especially for persons of, um, of working age. So that's why we could see that um, uh, the states, uh, the states with, um, with, with bigger amount of these social benefits could receive more temporary protected persons. So if we compare refugees uh, rights and uh, TPP's rights, uh, a lot of uh, similarities can be found. But uh, there are some, some, some positive and some uh, negative aspects um, uh, for both of them. A waiting time, for example, uh, for the, for the uh, decision of refugee status, uh, sorry. And from the other hand, it's a possibility uh, for the cancellation of uh, temporary protection status. Um, so that's that's the main uh, that's uh, the main rights of uh, temporary protected uh, protected persons, and um, and uh, about uh, the the last category of displaced persons. This is uh, internally displaced persons. Um, uh, IDPs are persons uh, who have been forced or obliged uh, to flee or to leave their homes, in particular as a result uh, of, of armed conflicts. Uh, so um, the, the, definition is, uh, the definition is given in the guiding principle, uh, principles on internal displacement. And internal displaced, um, uh, internal displaced person uh, like refugees left their homes but, but without crossing the border uh, to find safety. Uh, IDPs stay uh, with their own country and remain under the protection of, of its government. So except uh, guiding principles on internal displacement, there are a set of Council of, of Europe documents. And um, why, why the Council of Europe adopted uh, a, lot of, a lot of documents devoted to the international uh, displacement persons? The, the answer is very simple. Because, uh, sorry, uh, because um, more than more than ten uh, members of this organization from from seventy uh, from from uh, 47, uh, 40, 46 um, without Russia uh, had or or still have uh, IDPs, and you could see uh, on the slide, it's for example, um, Committee of Ministers recommendations, a general recommendation about internally displaced person um, that was adopted in uh, 2016 and uh, a range of um, recommendations um, that was adopted by the parliamentary assembly uh, parliamentary assembly of the uh, council of europe for example about education of refugees and internally displaced persons about um, uh, about uh, european forgotten people about um, uh, abolition of restrictions uh, of the right to vote and uh, or solving property issues. Uh, I, I have already mentioned this resolution, and a, a lot of a lot of other documents. So um, we could say that uh, internally displaced, uh, displaced the rights of internal displaced persons, and uh, the, uh, the this category was really enshrined in detail, detailed by the. Uh, Council of Europe uh, documents and what kind of um, and what kind of uh, rights um, uh, these uh, this person have. So um, let me change the slide. Okay. So if we're talking about rights of IDPs, um, you you have to you have to remember that uh, IDPs continue to have all rights. As they have before, so as nationals or stateless or foreigners, as as before uh, displacement. So they don't leave the country. Uh, however, because of, of displacement, they occur in a vulnerable position and uh, needed additional protection. So 
uh, they, they, they probably they, they will need social benefits and assistance, adequate housing or shelter for sure, because these people left their home. Uh, food, clothing, clean water, sanitation, right to education, medical care. But they they have these rights and, uh, uh, and, and they have it before the displacement. But um, it can be problems of, of the realization of these rights. So that's why all these rights must be guaranteed. And even additional legal acts adopted for the regulation of the access to medical care, for example, uh, for IDPs or education or labor market, etc and the wide range of uh, movement related rights, uh, for example, right to seek safety in another, in another part of the country, or right to leave the country uh, or their region, or right to seek uh, asylum in another country, and so on. Right to respect for, uh, for, for family lives, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there are uh, really a, a range of, um, uh, of, IDPs, um, of IDPs rights. Uh, uh, but, um, but let's uh, but let let's um, let's make a brief summary about the key European standards on the protection of displaced uh, displaced uh, persons' rights. So there is no treaty or even soft law document that covers the right to all categories of displaced persons. And, but, but but it's clear. And um, uh, despite the absence of a special European Convention of Refugee or asylum asylum issues. Um, uh, there is a special developed uh, detailed EU legislation and range of Council of Europe documents enshrined, enshrined a broad range of human rights of refugees and asylum, uh, asylum seekers or other persons who can apply for international uh, protection. And of course, case law of European Court of Human Rights, especially regarding to, to the principle of non-reformar and the prohibition of ill treatment. You are talking about temporary protection. It regulates on national level in different ways, and there are a few documents adopted by the Council of Europe. And uh, however, these acts uh, didn't make an influence on the states, uh, on the states' parties. But at the same time, only the European Union elaborated a special directive on this uh, this issue. And uh, as of today, uh, this is still the only document. I mean, temporary protection directive that regulates temporary protection, except, uh, except uh, I'd like to repeat it again, except various national legislation of different countries. And IDPs, the European Union uh, stated that uh, the, the European Union strongly supports uh, the guiding principles on internal displacement, but the special EU acts uh, that regulate this issue have not been adopted. And um, at the same time, uh, there are a range of, um, there are a range of Council of Europe treaties on general aspects of different um, uh, on, 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 on different human rights um, on different human rights. So, therefore, you can see that within the Council of Europe, I have indicated mostly uh, soft law documents. However, um, I need to underline uh, that the Council of Europe has the most efficient human rights protection system with a, such a diamond treaty as the European Convention of Human Rights. So there is no special convention on refugee IDPs as I, as I have already mentioned, but all provisions of general convention on human rights are applied to everyone under state party jurisdiction. So it means that uh, European Convention on Human Rights, Framework Convention on the Protection, uh, for the Protection of National Minorities, European Social Charter and European Social Charter Revised, Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these treaties are applied to displaced persons as well, IDPs, refugees, asylum seekers, et cetera. So that's why uh, the European Court of Human Rights considers the cases on displaced persons' rights. I, I cannot indicate all key cases that had a significant impact on national asylum system, uh, asylum seekers, refugees, IDPs legislation and practice in, in many countries. So I uh, just on the slide, you can see the examples of uh, cases of the European Court of Human Rights uh, related just to internal displacement or cases that are very important um, in the sphere of, 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 internal, of internal displacement. So this case law um, played a very important role um, in the development and in improvement uh, of Ukrainian legislation in the sphere of internal displacement. 
especially considering pensions and social benefits. For example, uh, for years, pensioners from, um, temp uh, from uh, temporary occupied territories without official um, registration as, as IDPs have not been able to receive their pension, uh, even at their uh, governmental controlled territories or in case of such a person return to the um, temporary occupied territories for more days as it was prescribed or didn't pass their verification, for example, and then so on. So Ukrainian judges applied the legal positions um, that was given by the, uh, the, by the judges of European Court of Human Rights and applied uh, case uh, law of the European Court of Human Rights, especially, for example, um, uh, either talking about uh, social issues uh, and social problems of IDPs, uh, Ukrainian judges applied uh, the, 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 the case, uh, the, the judgment, um, Pichpur versus, versus Ukraine, this is one of the famous ones. This, this is one of famous ones. And, um, and what else? And maybe uh, the, the last part of this, the last part of this lecture. Um, uh, let's talk about, uh, let's a little bit, uh, let's talk about, um, about main challenges, uh, about, um, about main challenges uh, of this war uh, for Europe and for the European Union. Uh, so except, of course, except financial, technical um, burden for, for, for host countries. So Europe could receive and has already come across during just, just these three months with the largest number of potentially asylum seekers, IDPs and um, uh, temporary, protect, uh, protection, uh, temporary protected persons that all European countries have, uh, have, have before 24th of February. And, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, the, there is no statistic about potential uh, asylum seekers and um, and the numbers could be bigger or um, could be bigger because of uh, thousands or even millions illegal migrants from from Ukraine who were staying in the European Union before the war and now probably they they would like to uh, legalize their their status and um, this is this is a challenge for the European Union asylum system and asylum policy of the European Union. So we have to we have to realize it. Uh, so um, as you, on the slide, you could see that the, 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 all these um, the, the numbers of um, IDPs, refugees, temporary protected persons are are interdependent. And I would like to pay your attention to the dependence. Uh, on the protection uh, of the IDP's rights uh, by Ukraine. So if Ukraine guarantees IDP's rights, it means that Europe will have less refugees and less temporary protected, uh, temporary protected uh, persons. But 8 million uh, have, already, uh, have already registered as, as IDP's. So this is, this, is the first this is the first main challenge. The, the, the numbers, the amount, of um, displaced persons. So the second, the people can change their statuses. So for example, if the person registered as IDP, as IDP, so is it possible for this, for this person to be a uh, TPP, for example? Yes, of course, why not? So uh, the, the statuses could be changed. And um, in case, uh, in case now it can be really, but we don't know the numbers. Uh, so there is a person who received IDP status and then apply for social, so for, for social benefits uh, for for Lawrence and then left Ukraine and they receive temporary protected uh, temporary protection uh, status. So you know in, in 2000 in 2016 there were a tough and not very good verification system from for for IDPs from Donetsk and Lugansk region regions uh, who stayed in their their home on the temporary occupied territory and then came from time to time came to territories uh, under the governmental control uh, just for, for, for social benefits. And for several years that was with the, with the, with the social benefits expansion and was, was everything. So it could be a problem as well, but I don't know the, the, the scale, the, the amount of this problem. 
And uh, considering the international law, Ukrainians really could be in every group of these displaced persons. Uh, so Ukrainians can apply for international protection, could be temporary protected persons, and of course could be IDPs. Um, so um, uh, Ukrainians can uh, can arrive and stay in, in Schengen uh, area for, for 90 uh, for 90 days without registration. But um, would it be possible to apply for international protection after this period? Of course, of course, it's possible, and. Uh, um, uh, and uh, and some so, so, some other questions. Uh, so among among those who uh, who, who fled Ukraine uh, are also Ukrainian um, Ukrainian nationals with this uh, several citizenship. I have already mentioned it. Uh, so this how to check the availability of citizenship of one of the EU state before given temporary protection. It's a question as well. And uh, maybe the last one displacement. Displacement is not only a humanitarian challenge. That's 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 only a, a political a human rights um, challenge, a, a financial challenge, uh, a technical challenge for for countries, and and uh, a lot of a lot of questions uh, could raise um, uh, could raise uh, within within this within this war. So I would like to stop at this moment because there there there, there could be a lot of questions. Uh, unfortunately, without answers, and um, we could talk uh, uh, talk talk more. But uh, you know, I, I I checked the time; it's it's almost one hour. Uh, so probably uh, our participants uh, will have some some questions or could share their um, their thoughts, their ideas, how to solve this problem, and uh, what kind of problem problems uh, could could be in future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ella, very, very much um, on behalf of everybody. This was an absolutely fascinating presentation and um, I'm sure we've all learned a great deal. Um, there is one question that, that uh, Lorenzo Morano has put into the Q&A, which I'm just going to, to put to you here. He's asking, do you think that the Ukrainian people are aware of the rights and benefits of the different categories, the displaced persons, temporary protected persons, asylum seekers, refugees, etc.? Do they decide upon these factors when they attempt to apply for a status? Um, thank, you, thank, thank you very much for this question. You know, it's, um, it's, it's a very difficult question. I think that um, I think a lot of Ukrainians have already known about uh, about the differences probably not about the difference between uh tpp and the refugee and refugee or asylum seeker seekers uh or or or, or applicants for for uh subsidiary protection of course it's it's it's, it's rather complicated issues but they know the difference between idp status and temporary protection status and of course, they could compare social benefits. So that's why I mentioned um, I mentioned the problem that could be uh, in future when the person tried to uh, to have uh, double statuses or two statuses, IDP and temporary protection. And uh, you know, during these eight years, we have a lot of. Um, uh, a lot of organization of volunteering and um, not only international um, international human rights protection organization, but our civil civil uh, so, so uh, our civil society know about these IDP statuses. So that's that's why uh, they have this net, this communication, this um, this possibility to share information uh, between. Ukrainians who try to left Ukraine. So that's that's why, and I see these leaflets and this information um, uh, about temporary protection states. And you know, this is a very simple procedure, and uh, a lot of Ukrainians even even don't know about the possibility to apply for refugee status. So that's a problem. But uh, don't forget that they will know about it after the cancellation of temporary protection. And after that, the Europe could appear with or could come across with, with a really huge problem, pro problem when this former temporary protected person 
would like to stay in Europe. So probably maybe a little bit more expression, but but I think that both of them know about about the difference. Yes. Well, thank you very much for that answer. And um, one of our other. Uh, participants has also just been showing appreciation as well for for your lecture saying it's very informative and exciting um, and I think that's something that we're all sharing as well Ella so I'm keeping an eye on the time um, because I, I also think we need to bring everything to a close as well shortly. Um, I think this is a topic we could go into a lot a lot more detail and I, I very, very much look forward to the opportunity to, to also do that in future with you. Um, please could I just express the gratitude of everybody at UNIWELL and everybody who's joined today for what it is that you've actually shared with us. I think I'm personally going away with, with a lot of these very impressive figures that, that you have shared with us, thinking about the 8 million people um, and everything that, that is, is happening at this moment. Um, you're here in the context of one of the UNIWELL arenas, which is focusing on individual and social well-being. Um, and I'd like to thank you again very much for, for being present and for, for sharing your, your knowledge and expertise with us. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Bye bye. Bye. Karen, thank you again. Have a nice. Uh, have a nice day. Thank you very much. If you would like to stay for just a minute, you're welcome. Um, yeah. yeah, I could leave, but just probably.